opportunity to gather here today. Thank you, Father, for the privilege, for the freedom that we have to be able to do so. Pray, Father, that uh, uh, you'll bless Ron and what he has prepared and what he presents. We pray that you'll bless us, help us to block out worldly thoughts and concerns and to focus on your word, to take it into our hearts and to live it. And may you be glorified by our words and our actions today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our first lesson we looked at basically after dealing with all of the above thoughts with regard to faith and our response to God with an emphasis that while we look at the words from one perspective, God looks at them from another perspective. And the emphasis of the New Testament, when you start talking about the fundamentals of faith, uh, the whole emphasis of Scripture is, is God wanting us to enter into a faith relationship with Him. That's what it's all about. Our trusting Him, our honoring Him, our being willing to give ourselves to Him. And that emphasis is, grows out of the fact that when we, we think in terms of our response to God, we have intellect, we have volition, we have emotion, uh, and uh, we begin dealing with all of the things that the whole heart responsive to God, becoming one with God. Uh, and if you haven't picked up on it yet, last week you were responsible for Hebrews, the first ten chapters. But our focus in Hebrews was upon who Christ is. And he is one with the Father, and he is one with man, with us. Uh, and that's, that's significant. Uh, one with the Father, he's able to... Uh, speak to the Father for us and us to the Father uh, for the Father. And that's that plays around into one large word, which is used at least twice in the book of Hebrews. And Christ is the is the what? Starts with an M. Mediator. Mediator. The one who stands between the two. The term in the book of Hebrews, though, gets a little larger than that. And in fact, the emphasis from chapter 2, the end of chapter 2, down to the middle of chapter 10, is Christ is is what kind of mediator? He is a high priest, a high priest. And it's rather interesting when you read the book of Hebrews, you'll bump into a passage that says he is the high priest pertaining to the things of God, and he is our high priest. Well, he is our mediator. He's God's mediator. But the emphasis has to do with from the book of Hebrews is God is calling us into a covenant relationship. And, of course, we all slip easily into understanding it's a little bit like marriage. Marriage is a faith relationship. It is a love relationship. But above everything else, it is a what? Covenant. Covenant, covenant relationship. You enter into a covenant relationship. And that's the emphasis, that's the thesis given to us in Holy Writ. This morning we're going to shift gears. You're responsible for the first seven chapters of Matthew. Uh, not that we're going to look at every single verse in Matthew, in the first seven chapters, but we are going to look at Jesus historically, and we're going to look at him uh, intellectually, and we're going to look at him morally and spiritually. But I have an exercise on the board. Any of you ever run into an imposter? In any area? A pseudo realtor? You ever run into a pseudo realtor? Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a pseudo policeman. What do they do? Put a, a bubble on top of their car and stop people with a red light? And uh, are they? Oh no, they've got a car that they've got a bubble on top, 
and there's a pseudo. An imposter. How does an imposter behave? Here's what I'm getting at. You start thinking about Jesus. Jesus was either an imposter or a fanatic or simply a man or he was the Son of God. Does Jesus act like an imposter? Well, let's talk about how an imposter acts. What does an imposter do with regard to himself? What does he do with his resume? Makes it better than it is. Right? <laughs> he sort of inflates it. Uh, and he makes himself, makes himself look good, pays himself. An imposter does what? What does he do with his with his resume? What else does he do with his with his history? What does he do with his history? He embellishes. He embellishes. Now that's a big word, but an imposter is one who embellishes. Uh, an imposter basically is always striving to do what? Create the illusion they know what they're doing. Yeah, trying to impress people, create an illusion uh, that he is important, that he has something to offer, wherewithal, and uh, we've had a few of those who've been exposed through, through the years with regard to what they are. Uh, we can explore this at length, and I hope you'll do some thinking about it, maybe have some discussion about the difference between someone who is real and someone who is an imposter. Uh, an imposter is talking about, always talking about where he's from and where he went to school and what he's achieved and how many positions he's held and how, and you just keep adding and adding and adding and adding. Did Jesus do that? No, my goodness. He was so humble. He was from where? Nazareth. Graduated from what school? Carpenter school, maybe. Carpenter. How, many, how many degrees did he have? Uh, what kind of position did he have in Nazareth? I've been to Nazareth and they finally got a signal light in 2001. That's how small it is. It's a small town. It's basically now inhabited uh, more uh, by Arabs than in anybody else. Uh, there's a good strong congregation in Nazareth. We were able to go to worship there. And the man who does the preaching there is a dentist as well as a preacher. I found that rather interesting. But an imposter. What is, did Jesus go around trying to impress? Well, I'm from Nazareth. What did the people of that day say about yeah. Nazareth? Nothing good can come out of Nazareth. Yeah. That was their question. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Uh, was he offended? Was he afraid of mentioning this from Nazareth? Uh, did he try to keep it quiet? Boys, just keep quiet about the fact that I'm nothing but a carpenter. Did he try that? Uh, did he talk about himself in that venue at all? He didn't. How does a fanatic, we're spending maybe more time than we need to here, a fanatic, how does a fanatic behave? Anybody ever work with a fanatic? one track line. It's all I think about is one thing. A fanatic, whatever it is, they think about one thing. They think about what they want to accomplish and how to accomplish it. Uh, a fanatic. Something like fantasy. Huh? Fantasy. You fantasize. They fantasize a great deal. A fanatic. Uh, a fanatic <clears throat> is one who does not allow anyone else to say anything. Uh, who was it that thundered and roared and started World War II? What was he? Uh, he originally was simply a... Everybody's had a great politician. He was not a politician. He was a fanatic. And he had no regard for anyone except his... Or anything except his agenda. That's all he wanted to accomplish. He ran roughshod over anybody and everybody. And if he could not silence them, he would do what? Get rid of them. Fanatic. That's We're going a little not very deep on this. A mere man? Was Jesus a fanatic? No. Was he an imposter? No. Was he just a man? Let's stay there for a moment. Or was he the Son of God? Now, as a Christian, our, our conviction is, and we made the confession, that Jesus is what? I believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God. That's our confession. 
That's where we begin. That's where we stay. That is our focus. And there is the imperative being drawn out with regard to him. Now, you begin studying the life of Jesus. There are any number of areas to study. And I've confined you just to seven chapters, not because that's all there is, but because for, for the sake of our study, I want you to look at these, these seven chapters. And I want you to look at them, first of all, look at them from the standpoint of the historical. History is what? What History is what happened. Period. Uh, and Jesus was, what did you say about Jesus? You can say that he was born on a day in history, which was, that was December the what? No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> we do not know the birth date of Jesus, but whatever it was, it was not in the month of December. Uh, and it was not toward the end of December. Uh, uh, we know some things with regard to that because of the uh, occupations of the people there and where were the shepherds? They were in the fields guarding their sheep by night and they did not do that in the winter time. And December would not have been a good time to be out there with the sheep. Uh, you began dealing with all that. Little simple things. Where was he born? Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. Bethlehem, which mm -hmm. actually means what? City of David. Mm -hmm. uh, someone said, what's significant about that? Well, what's significant about it is that's where God said that his son would be born. And that's stated where? What prophet said that? You've got the notes in the book of Matthew if you've studied them at all. You've got the notes, and he was Isaiah. Micah. Well, Micah. Micah. And Bethlehem was <laughs> Bethlehem Ephrata. Though you are small from the standpoint of towns or cities in this whole nation, from you shall come forth the Savior. That's the language of Micah 5, verse 1 and 2. So you've got a historical fact and a prophetic fact. And with regard to Christ, you're going to begin dealing with him in the uh, in the book of Matthew chapter 1, and we'll go back to that text just now. What are the first 17 verses of Matthew? What do they contain? Genealogy. And what in the world is a genealogy? Family tree. Family tree. How many of you, how far back can you trace your family tree? Uh, pretty far. We'll go. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it goes back to like uh, the... Uh, 1776. 1776 in that area? Yeah. Who's that where you all on? Uh, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> you know my point. Yeah. 1776. Well, you begin dealing with how many? How far can you trace back your family tree? Uh, two or three generations. Two or three generations. You got tracers back. That's right. You got a, you got a name that's four or five generations old, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. His name was what was his middle name? See, see, okay, <laughs> and you, you go back looking at looking at all of those things. You've got the genealogy. Uh, you've got a long family tree. I don't have seventeen. Do you know, <laughs> I have seventy seventy six. I can trace mine back to a man from Scotland, Washington Augustus <laughs> Bryant, who came from Scotland to Pennsylvania, to South Carolina, to Alabama. And he settled in a little place called Alexandria, Alabama, and settled on four sections of land. And he had four sons. And what is even more comical is each of his sons had four sons. And that whole area was divvied up among the Bryants. And you start dealing with that, you can trace it back. I, I can go back to Scotland with him. And uh, that would be the early, uh, the middle of the 1700s, from all the way down to this point in time. What's the significance of a family tree? Pardon? Uh, relations back. Oh. Well, now some people can make believe. Well, you know, I'm descended from. It's like the fellow who said that uh, uh, he's talking about his his grandpa. Uh, Great grandfather's uh, military career. He said he fought with Washington and he fought with uh, Lincoln. And he, he said and he had a whole list of people he fought with, 
And you think he's going to talk about believers in the military. He said he couldn't get along with anybody. Uh, <laughs> so there's a, a family tree. How many generations do you have in Matthew's account? How many? Two. Forty-two. Forty-two. Mm-hmm. The first fourteen give you his lineage in relationship to the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way down to Judah. Then you're going to find that the next 14 generations all relate to whom? Kings. Patriarchs, kings, and then the nation. Now what's rather interesting though, uh, are all of the people of the genealogy included in that record in Matthew, Matthew chapter 1? There are three kings left off the list. Over there, about the 28th, uh, Jeconiah, also called Coniah, okay. Jeconiah, Jehoiakim, Jeconiah, Coniah. Uh, there are three that left off there. Well, someone says, now, wait a minute. That would be a red flag. It would have been a red flag if what? <laughs> Here's what's rather interesting. What did the Jews <clears throat> study always? Always they studied. They not only kept, but they studied the genealogies. And they had some quarrels about the genealogies. You've got the genealogies on the list of Jesus, but when you begin dealing with the historical perspective, the genealogy in Matthew's account is from Abraham down to whom? Forty-two generations are listed. The Jews would have said they could recite. They could recite their genealogies. I can remember Washington Augustus, and I've got some of his a little bit, just a little bit of information. There was one of the four sons that he had had four sons, and he gave when they came along, he gave all four of them the same middle name. And you'll never guess what it was. The middle name for his four sons was Daddy. Now go figure. I can't figure that out. But the whole point with regard to a genealogy is his historical data. Here is historical data with regard to Christ. How does a fairy tale begin? Once upon a time. Once upon a time in a land far, far away. That's how it begins. Does the Gospel of Matthew read like a fairy tale? No. How many? How many are in the genealogy in Matthew and Luke's account? How many are in the list? And it goes. One goes from Abraham down to Joseph. The other one goes from Joseph back to Adam. And how many generations? How many are there? You ready? Fifty-five. Fifty-five. Now here's rather interesting. In the record of the New Testament, the genealogy begins with, uh, the New Testament begins with a historical report, a historical perspective that basically says, check it out. If you're going to deal with genealogies, check it out. I met with a gentleman in Flinco, Alabama. I was there in the meeting in 2004. And we were visiting, and uh, he'd been a fighter pilot during World War II, and he was an interesting old gentleman. He said, uh, "He said, I, I, my name's Bryant also, but I'm sure we're not related. I said, well, I'm going to be at your house tomorrow, and you've got your family tree. He said, yep. So we get there, and we open up the genealogy according to all the research that's been done, and there on the second page, I learned that my great-grandfather and his grandfather were brothers. So we're related. He said, well, I can't, is it all right with you if I still deny it? I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> but you see, they had it in print. They had it in print. What do we have of the genealogy of Jesus? We have it in print. Mm-hmm. Now, here's a trick question for you. In Matthew's account, whose genealogy is recorded? Besides Jesus, whose genealogy is, is recorded? Joseph's. Joseph's. Why? He's the last one before Jesus. And in Joseph's account, what do you have? You have the legal genealogy. Luke's account 
is Mary's genealogy. Mm-hmm. The literal. The literal. And all of that is set out in bold language for the Jews to study, and they were studying the genealogies. And the thing that's rather interesting, Matthew 1 and Luke's account, Luke 3, they're not called into question. They're not denied by the Jews. Why are they not denied? They have all that data. They could stand up and quote off the various genealogies. They knew the genealogy from Abraham through Isaac through Jacob. I don't need to tell this story, but I'll tell it anyway. Uh, there was a little uh, six-year-old that was going to uh, quoting scripture. He couldn't read it. And he started off, and, and Abraham forgot Isaac. He didn't know what begot meant, but he knew what forgot meant. So he thought he had it right. He, he forgot Isaac, and Isaac forgot to go all the way through. But now, go to, go to the book of, of, uh, of Luke. And go to the first part of chapter 2 and the first part of chapter 3. And what do you have in those two records, Luke 2 and Luke 3? What do you have (coughs) of historical significance? Somebody blurt it out. Somebody read it. What do you have? First few verses, Luke 2. born of Mary. What do you have? What else? Luke 2. Anything else? When was it? Days of Caesar on You got it? Here you are. Here you are. Verse 1. A decree went out from Caesar. Who was emperor of Rome? Caesar Augustus. And what was the decree? A census. Any historical evidence with regard to Augustus Caesar? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any historical evidence with regard to the census that took place uh, when Quirinius was governing Syria? Well, the answer is yes. What do you have then in Luke chapter 2? Historical data. This is not once upon a time in a land far, far away. You can look at Jesus historically. Look at chapter 3. How does it begin? Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, and then he just gives you a list. Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and he got carried away. Herod, the, being tetrarch, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. And who were the high priests? <coughs> Annas and Caiaphas. Annas and Caiaphas. Wait a minute. I thought we only had one high priest. What are we doing with two? <laughs> who was recognized by the Jews as the <clears throat> high priest? Historically, who was recognized as the high priest when Christ was born and during the life of Christ? Who was recognized as the high priest? Annas. Well, what happened to old Annas? To cut to the chase, he got crosswise with the Roman powers and they defrocked him. He couldn't be the high priest anymore. Did he fight it? In his way, he did. In fact, in turn, what did he do? He couldn't be the high priest and the Jews went along with him, so each son that he had serve as a high priest. But they could only serve by a period, for a period of time and then they were they were cut off by by the Romans. They weren't serve very long. And then he finally ran out of sons and they made his what? Made his son in law high priest and his name was what? Caiaphas. Well see what I'm giving you is this this is historical data. You're looking at the history of, of Christ. You're looking at his genealogy. You're looking at who was in power, what was going on. You've got some information with regard to the Romans. They were they were the power over ruling everybody. But the Jews were there. They still had cert- certain prerogatives and powers given to them. You've got the historical data given to you in that context. Anything else come into your mind when you look at this section? You're looking at Christ historically. 
now you began moving on into this whole section, you began to deal with some things with regard to Christ. Mm-hmm. In that third chapter, an, an event takes place, and Jesus meets a, a gentleman by the name of what? John. The John. John the what? The Baptist. Uh, give, that, give me a different way of saying that. John, John the, the Baptist, Baptist or John the what? The baptizer. The baptizer. Why is he called the Baptist? <laughs> because he baptizes his people. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's the emphasis. Uh, those who do baptizing, you ever baptized anybody? Have you here? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're a baptist. That's it. <laughs> you're a baptizer. <laughs> you're a baptizer. Uh, that was not the name of any religious organization. That was the name of. That's like the blacksmith. Uh, I guess one man made made an argument with me. He said, well, uh, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, so John, Je- that made Jesus a Baptist. Well, just like Jesus, the Nazarene. Take him a Nazarene. Uh, Nazarene. Yeah. <laughs> I like the answer to that, though. He said, well, if, if, his, if his being baptized made him a Baptist, I guess when the, the horse is shooed by the blacksmith, the horse becomes a blacksmith. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> what do you have? You had introduction to a man by the name of John. <clears throat> and John's the subject of the prophecy in Isaiah 40. <laughs> and John is born of a priest by the name of Zacharias. Zacharias, and his wife's name was Elizabeth. 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 Uh, how many courses of priests were there among the Jews? <laughs> we don't ever get this kind of information out. How many courses of priests were there? There were 24 courses of priests. Mm-hmm. Now, that opens the mind a little bit with regard to the priests, the chief priests, <coughs> the elders. Those are real designations of men who had official capacity among the Jews. And the Jews would serve their course, do their function, and go back to their work. You have a lot of information about John the Baptist. In this particular context, though, you have an event on a day in history. Jesus came to John the Baptist. What did John call him? Matthew 3. What did he say? Behold! What? The Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus came to be baptized of John. Uh, remember back when they used to make uh, movies out of Bible material? They'd have one about the life of Christ. I was about, I guess, about 14, 15 years of age. And I was 15 years of age. <clears throat> I won't tell you the first movie I ever saw, but uh, it was in Jacksonville, Alabama, a little theater downtown. But we went to see, uh, uh, it was about Christ. And when he's baptized, he's in a line like at uh, a carnival, you know, going in. He's in a line. And he comes to John, and John tells him what he's going to tell him. We'll talk about that in a moment. And Jesus got down on his knees in the water, and John took a gourd and poured water on, on his head. Now, this will frost your pumpkin. The actor said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I was 15 years of age and they almost made me leave the movie theater because I laughed so loud. Uh, incongruous that something like that would be so blown out of proportion. But what you have in Matthew 3 is you have a historical event. <clears throat> it's historical from this perspective. Jesus lived how many years before he came to John and be, to be baptized and before he began his ministry? How many years? 30. Why 30? We don't know. Yeah, we do. I'm we know this. <laughs> <laughs> we know historically why it was at 30. Among the Jews, a young man, he went through the bar mitzvah. That's what they call it now. I'm not sure what they called it back then. And that was about 12, 12 to 14 years of age. He was bar mitzvah. Is that a good phrase, way to say it? <clears throat> and at that age, he was... Uh, accounted, given responsibility to act like a man. 
from that point. But when was he recognized as a man with the prerogatives of a man? Age 30. 30. Age 30. Jesus is serving, working in, in Nazareth as a carpenter. He is there. Uh, we have very little said about him. We have one little event in book chapter, in book of Luke. Uh, and he's, well, they, his family leaves him in Jerusalem. They're on the way home, and where's Jesus? They have to go back and find him, and where do they find him? In the synagogue. Teaching. In, they find him in the temple area, reasoning and discussing the law with the priest and the lawyers. <laughs> and his parents are, are saying, oh, you can remember what they said. This is a historical event. At 12 years of age, he made this statement. Know you not that I must be about my father's, be about my father's business. Mm -hmm. That's the only statement that's made in the book of Luke or in the, any, any of the accounts about him as a, as, a, as a child. But here he is. I must be about my father's business. There was a sensitivity about him and awareness about him, but he did not begin his public ministry until this event in Matthew chapter 3, a historical event. And when John, he came to John to be baptized of John, what did John say? You should be baptized of me. I have need to be baptized of you. And it's rather interesting. Jesus makes a reply to John the Baptist. And what was it? He talks to John about himself and about, about John. What did he say? <clears throat> Permit it to be so. Instead of you to fulfill all righteousness. It, it is behooving that you and I fulfill all righteousness. We need to have a discussion about why Jesus was baptized. Was he baptized because he had repented of his sins? No. He had no sin. He did not have any sins. Why then was he baptized? To fulfill all righteousness. That was his statement, and that's large. And you need to study it out very carefully, looking at what it really involved him in fulfilling what God required. Now, we have really reason to discuss this at greater length, but I'm going to give you just this little bit of a footnote. Jesus came to be, in every single way possible, fully identified with man. His baptism was an event when he was fully identified with man, not meeting any obligation from the standpoint of spiritual renewal, but from the standpoint of being fully identified with man. On top of that, when he was baptized, what did that do to the preaching and teaching of John the Baptist? Uh, gave it a little shot in the arm. Gave it credence. Yeah. Gave it credence. Yeah. Here, here he was. And then he's baptized, and then he's... What happens historically? What happens? After he's baptized, what happens? Come on, folks, it's he there. He right? the wilderness and is All right. The Holy Spirit said, get in the truck, we're going to the wilderness. Is that what he said? He was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness, and there he met, or was... There he was for how many days? Forty days fasting and... Praying. praying. Now hang on now. Fasting and praying, that means that after that period of time, he was probably weaker than he's ever been. No. Huh? No. Explain yourself. Because of the fasting and praying, he was stronger than he'd ever been. He was not weak. No. Physically, nourished, malnourished, mm -hmm. but spiritually, fully able to meet the tempter. We can do some more study about that as time permits. But in the historical flow of things, Satan comes, and Satan, that's the word we use, and that word means what? Historically, what does the word Satan mean? Accuser. The accuser. He makes an accusation. He's always accusing. There's Satan accusing. And he comes, and he begins to uh, come to Jesus, but he approaches him in a rather unusual way. Twice he says what? How does he begin his temptation? If you are. If you are. Mm -hmm. 
first indication in all of Scripture, here we are, if you are the Son of God, do what? Huh? Command these stones to be made bread. Would that have been a major achievement on Jesus' part? No. But what do you learn very quickly? He's hungry, so there's the avenue of approach. But what does Jesus say? And he quotes a passage. It is, what does he say? Every single reply. This is interesting. Historically, he says, it is written. And the first quote is, it is written, man shall not live by what? Bread alone. But bread alone. Bread alone. from the mouth of God. By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Anything wrong with having a good meal? No. That's not the point. The point is, is we're going to live, and if we're going to live for God, we're going to need to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's where we're going to be living. That's where we're, where we're going to go. Then he says, what does he say next? I know you're just dying to say it, so go ahead and say it. What does Satan say next? So God throws himself down. It is written. <clears throat> and what does Satan do? Surprise, surprise, surprise. What does Satan do? He quoted scripture. He quoted scripture. You know the location of it? What passage it was? Psalm 91. Psalm 91. And he said, It is written, He shall give his angels what? charge concerning you. So Satan knew scripture and he knew something about the angels. <laughs> That's interesting. And what did Jesus say in reply? He quoted another passage from the book of what? In fact, all of the answers Jesus gave came right out of what book? Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. And what did he say? Shall I put the word of God in the test? You shall not no. Tempt the Lord your God. Uh, you have the English Standard Version there. Is that what it says in the English Standard? Uh, I, I didn't read the English Standard. The reason I was asking is because I was going to, but didn't. Uh, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. What, what does that mean, to tempt the Lord your God? Can That's God be tempted good. with evil? No. What does it mean to tempt God? Put God to the test. Put God to the test. And there are those who are going to put God to the test from time to time in their life. Well, <coughs> this, this, he, won't, he won't condemn this or he won't say this. Then the last, last charge, he doesn't quote scripture, but what does he do? All of what? Satan's historical statement. Third temptation. You'll fall down and worship me, I'll give you everything you see. All right. So he has a vision of all that's 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 available. You'll bow down and worship me, I will give you all of these things. And he concludes with a declaration that is one of the first statements in the New Testament about the subject of worship. And what is it? She worship the Lord your God only. And him only shall you serve. And what you have is a historical operation. There's a historical event. And then he leaves there and he is ministered to by the angels, the historical event. And then he begins to call the disciples. And who are the first four that are called? For what? For what? Fishermen. And their names are? Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Now I'm going to pause here for a moment. Historically, it's rather interesting to begin to delve into the makeup of the disciples, the apostles that Jesus called. Give me some background with regard to the apostles. There were 12 of them. What do we know about the first four that were called were what? The fishermen. Give me some perspective on the others. They were all from where? Except one. The same one that after a while becomes the deceiver, the, the betrayer, a historical event. All of them were from where? Galilee. All of them were from Galilee. 
But now rather than trace this out, we know one of them was a traitor to the Jews. In fact, he had become a what? Tax collector. Tax collector. And tax collector, he had an office, and a tax collector back then would collect all that was required, and he had to get his living somewhere, so he... He got a little extra from each person that paid their taxes. That was Matthew. And Jesus called him and he became, what was his other name? Matthew and his other name was what? Levi. Levi. I thought you might know that. He began dealing with all of the, other, all of the others. And of, of all of them that are there, the one that stands out because of the trouble he caused is, is Judas. Then we've got some others. Uh, we've got uh, Nathaniel. We've got Philip. We've got another Simon called Simon the Zealot. <coughs> Simon the Zealot. We've got two Judases, two Simons. Uh, but here's something rather interesting. When you begin looking at the at the apostles, historically, what do we know about them from the standpoint of their ability, their training, and their inclination? What do we know about them? How many of them were scholars? They were not highly educated, men. And They all had the common education of the people of day and age. Everyone had to go to the same school and all had to graduate on the same level. Uh, they were described by the Jews later on as what kind of men? Ignorant and unlearned. Now, you might try those two words on and see how they fit. Ignorant and unlearned. They do not have any education, all of those things. He began looking at all the evidence with regard to it. And then he's chosen the, the first four. And then he goes with the disciples to a place that's going to be rather significant in the rest of our study, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Where did he go? <coughs> he's outside of the city of... And I'm going to show off. He's outside the city of Capernaum. Is that the way we pronounce it? Capernaum. Uh, Dr. Dale Manor, a good friend of mine, he studied all that language and all of that. And uh, he, he, he talked about Jerusalem and Capernaum. And uh, I got to introduce him one time. Uh, he has a Ph.D. in ancient and Middle Eastern archaeology. The only man in our brotherhood who does. I got to introduce him. I said, it's not, I'm not surprised that he mispronounces all these words. I mean, his, his whole career lies in ruins. Archaeology. There he was. And Jesus goes outside the city of Capernaum and preaches what? The Sermon on the Mount. Now, here's what's rather interesting, folks. If we don't study the historical setting and accept the historical data, it either happened or it didn't. If it didn't happen and it, they said it did, it's not reliable. If it's not historically reliable, the scriptures aren't reliable. But you're dealing with historical data. You're not dealing with once upon a time in a land far, far away. You're looking at material that is incredibly important. Now you're going to shift gears and we're going to look at Jesus in the language of Scripture, we're going to look at him intellectually. Do some study this week on the way Jesus talked and what he said. How many theories did Jesus set forth? How many speculations? How many suppose or what ifs? How many, how many of those did Jesus do? Yeah. It's rather intriguing when you begin dealing with uh, the apostles. Now let's let's go a little bit. John's going to be teaching next week. We're going to be in Florida, the Lord willing. Here's something rather interesting. If he goes to Matthew or goes to John, you know yet where you're going. The uh, moral and spiritual. Moral and spiritual, intellectual, intellectual, moral and spiritual. Okay, you're going you're going to deal going to deal with these things because here's here's Jesus intellectually. Tell me where Jesus stood in the midst of all of those people there. He stood head and shoulders above every single one of them. Of course, you could expect that. He had how many PhDs? <laughs> he didn't. Well, and the apostles were given to him by God. 
So they had to be special men. Yeah. God knew they were, mm-hmm. whether they had an education or not. Yeah. You read what I was going to say, but I'll say it anyway. (laughs) Is it possible possible that the apostles invented Jesus? Man, if they did, we ought to bow down and worship all of of them. We shouldn't do that. Any question or comment? Time got away too quick today. But uh, thank you for being here. And I hope and pray that all goes well with your dry runs to the hospital. You made two this week already.